Welcome along to another Film Friday. This week we're going to be looking at shooting a range of different film cameras and a number of different types of film stocks. If you're completely new to film photography, I recommend you watch the video I uploaded last week, which is an introduction to film, and it basically just explains the fundamentals. If you're up to speed though, and you're ready to start shooting, let's get to it. We're going to start today with the Olympus Trip 35. This is a compact 35mm point and shoot film camera. Uh, these are called that because there's very little you need to do with them to get great results right out of the gate. It's a camera that doesn't really let you make any mistakes. Now uh, I'm going to show you how to load a film and we can get out there and shoot with this. I've also got this close focus attachment lens from Olympus which screws into the front here. Uh, so we can take that with us and see what we get with this. So we've got our Olympus trip here. Um, I'm just going to show you how to open the back and what you need to do to get a film into this bad boy. So let's, uh, there's a catch at the bottom of the camera here. We'll pop that and then the back opens up. You can see two spaces here. On the left hand side is where we're going to load our film. On the right hand side is a pickup spool where it's going to load in and get pulled across. This part here is called the film gate. There's a couple of little cogs here with teeth on. We need to make sure those line up with the sprocket holes on the film, but that's it. There's nothing much more to it. So really, like you take your film, um, we've got our roll of Kodak Portra 400 here. There's, you'll see with the film that uh, there's a top and a bottom to it, like this part here, which sticks out. That wants to be that way around. This part's called the leader. So we need to push this up. This is our rewind lever for when we uh, finish our film. Uh, so this goes up, that just goes in there. The leader gets pulled across like this, so that it's going to line up with these cogs. And we need to thread this tongue part of the end into, you can see it on, uh, hopefully you can see it, on this part here there's uh, a slot, which you can see, it's a little bit fiddly, I'm trying to do this under the camera here. But that just goes into there and push it all the way through until you can just barely see it kind of coming out the other end. Now, if your trip is on A here on automatic, which is what we want it to be on when we're shooting, just for now we'll just switch that over to 2.8 just so we can get this rolled in, otherwise it will stop us. So from that, we can take a photo and as you pull, you'll see it starts to pull through. It might not immediately line up just exactly right with here, so you might have to give it a little bit of a little bit of help there, but as soon as you can see it kind of pulling across like that, you can feel the teeth of those cogs there, close the back up, fully advance it. And the next thing I'd advise you to do, and this is true of this camera and all SLR cameras of this type that, that load film this way, uh, well sorry, this is a point and shoot, but the, uh, uh, the OM-1 which we're looking at and the other cameras, there's a lot of cameras which load this way. So rotate this round, this is the rewind handle, rotate this round just until you feel a little bit of tension. And the reason I suggest doing this is so that, as you can see here, in this window, there's currently an S, we wanna advance it until we get to one. Uh, so you can click, and then as you turn, you'll see this start to turn. If that doesn't turn, it means that we haven't properly loaded the film and it's not being pulled out of the, of the canister properly. So that's something to always look out for and we can just keep clicking this until we get to one. So we can see now we're on our first shot and we're ready to go. The last thing that we need to do on this camera is to set the speed of the film that we've loaded. And you do that in this camera by rotating this ring on the front here. There's a very small window just here which says ASA next to it. ASA is exactly the same as ISO, it's just older terminology. So we're gonna turn that until we see 400 and there we go, 400, and we're ready to shoot. It's as simple as that. Get this back onto A, make sure that's on A, and you're good to go. I'm shooting two different films in the trip. The first is Kodak Portra 400. It's a modern color negative film, known for its natural colors, fine grain, and ease of scanning. I'm also using Fujifilm Neopan Acros 100, a black and white film with rich tones, almost invisible grain, and sharp detail.
One of the things I love about the Trip 35 is that this is a camera that will never ever need a battery. The only thing that's electronic in this camera is the light meter and that's powered by this solar cell which sits around the front of the lens. I've brought the close focus attachment lens with me and I'm now looking for mushrooms. I think I've found some just down here. Here I'm using something called a cable release screwed into the shutter button. It means I can take a picture without touching the camera, reducing shake. Next up today is the Olympus OM-1. This type of camera is called an SLR. That stands for single lens reflex and it means as you look through the viewfinder of the camera, you're looking straight out through the lens. There's a reason this type of camera makes the perfect next step from using something like the Trip Compact and that's because it has fully manual controls and just the essentials you need to understand photography. It has your ISO setting, your aperture and your shutter speed. Uh, to help you along the way, it does have an inbuilt light meter which reads light coming through the lens and tells you whether your exposure will be good with a needle that moves as you change your settings. If it's in the middle, that's good. If it's in the plus, that will be an overexposed image which will be washed out. In the minus will be underexposed which will be dark. It loads film the same way the trip does. Uh, so there's not much more to say at this stage. Let's just get out and shoot with it. The first thing you notice about using the OM-1 after the trip is that the viewfinder is huge. It makes focusing and composing so easy. I took a walk down to the shore at low tide to see what I could find and get a different angle on the seawall. I love coming here to Stanley Park during the week. It's so quiet and the trails are really peaceful. I've been coming here for a few days now to shoot the film cameras that I talked to you about. Uh, and today's the first day that the sun's come out and it's really hitting the leaves on the trees with these autumn colors. Um, it's the perfect day to shoot slide film with its really vibrant, rich colors. And I want to show you what that looks like. In the OM-1, I'm shooting Fujifilm Velvia 50. This is a famous slide film well known for its really vibrant, rich color, high contrast and fine grain. In those earlier photos, I was using Kodak T-Max 100, a modern black and white film known for its sharp details, ultra fine grain, and I find more moderate contrast than the Fuji Acros. Now we're getting serious. This uh, camera system, the Hasselblad, is something that I was thinking about getting into for a very long time before I kind of mustered up the courage to take the step. It's a little bit daunting at first because even if you're familiar with using film cameras, it's such a different looking camera and the controls are different um, that you, it's kind of intimidating, but really like it's, it's not that different. Um, the whole, like the principles and the thinking behind film photography, if you've got that from those other cameras, this, it's, uh, it's actually really surprisingly simple to use. It's a beautifully designed camera in that it's modular, which means the whole thing kind of comes apart. Um, and that allows you to use different viewfinders, different focusing screens, different lenses, uh, different film backs. I mean, that in itself is, is huge. You can take the back off this camera and swap it in for another one. So that means you can have two different film speeds with you for a day. Um, or you can have black and white in one and color in the other, which is kind of what I like to do and mix things up a little bit. These particular backs shoot a six by six square frame, six by six centimeters. So it's a kind of huge, um, a huge negative there or a huge exposure. So with those square frames, it will shoot 12 exposures to a roll. You can get a back called a 16 back, which as it sounds, will shoot 16 exposures to a roll and they're more of a landscape crop at six by 4.5 centimeters. Um, yeah, so you can really mix things up with this. I mean, you can see like, you can take out one viewfinder, put in another one, and then put your film back on and you've got a whole different kind of, uh, different approach uh, to, to how you might set about your day. 
The first thing that really got me hooked on these cameras was when I went into a camera store and picked one up for the first time. Um, and you have this viewfinder on the top, which folds down flat, which is a really nice design. And you can kind of lift it up and it gives you this, you look straight down into the camera through a mirror, which is looking straight through the lens. And it's a really unusual like way of looking through a camera at first. And it gives you this kind of weird, it looks like a world within a world. Um, I mean, I love pictures that have just been taken staring straight down into the viewfinder because it's just such an unusual way of seeing that um, it, there's something about that which is really exciting. The viewfinder is huge. There is a loop in the viewfinder which you can trigger with a, a little catch inside there. I'll try and show you that in a video outside. And that means that you can either stare like straight down into the viewfinder at like a waist level, which is why these are sometimes called waist level finders, or you can put this up and put your eye to it and it behaves more like a, like a conventional viewfinder where you're staring, you know, pressed up against it, um, which can be advantageous if you're needing to get very fine focus or you've got too much light and there's reflections and things like that, although this does do a good job of mitigating that. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's an exciting camera to use and it's a camera which, which I will give its own uh, video later on. There's so much to say about this camera that it deserves an episode all of its own and that we can get into. But I'd really like just to touch upon getting out and using it and uh, yeah, we can go from there. As well as using Kodak Portra, I'm going to shoot some T-Max 400. This is just a faster version of the film we used earlier in the OM-1. I'm also using a film by Ilford called Pan F Plus 50, a very fine grain black and white film with high contrast and sharp details. The first thing you notice when looking through the viewfinder is that the image is flipped left to right because you're looking at the mirror. This is the magnifying loop I was talking about earlier. You can put your eye to this and see things in much more detail. Taking action shots with the Hasselblad is tricky, but you can do it. It just takes a more deliberate approach and some patience. Shooting these mushrooms with the Hasselblad is so much easier than it was yesterday with the trip. There's a huge image in the viewfinder. It's much easier to compose your shot. Uh, the trip is just like, it's just a bit of fun really. It's like aim and hope. You can measure out your focus distance, uh, but otherwise you're kind of guessing where you're framing. Uh, with the Hasselblad, it's just much easier and you have a much better chance of, of getting the picture that you're actually after. Here I'm using a macro tube, which enables close-up focusing and a small torch to shine through the mushroom caps. I wanted to end today by talking about a type of camera that we haven't really touched on yet. And that's just the kind of pure, entertaining, fun novelty camera. There's a company called Lomography that for the last 20 years or so have been doing a lot to keep film photography alive. And they've been doing that by celebrating the flaws in old cameras, Frankensteining different cameras together, selling these weird and wonderful, I mean, some people like hate what they're doing, some people love it. Personally, I've got a few of their cameras and I really enjoy using them. Now, this one, which I've been using, is called the Sprocket Rocket. It's a camera with a plastic lens that shoots a panorama over two frames of a 35 millimeter negative. Uh, it also exposes over the socket holes of the, uh, the sprocket holes of the film. And that, you have to get this scanning contraption with it to, uh, to scan the film properly. Uh, I'm gonna show you what these look like and you can kind of decide for yourself what you think. Uh, but I think these are an important part of being creative in film photography and just fun. So this week we looked at four different cameras which you could see as beginner, intermediate, uh, a little bit more advanced and something that's just fun. We looked at a bunch of different films. Something that did become clear to me as I was putting this together is that really to go into any depth, we need to be looking at one camera or one type of film in individual episodes. And I will be doing that in future. 
Next week though, we're gonna be looking at developing your own black and white film at home. If you've come this far, then you owe it to yourself to learn how to do that. It's really rewarding and yeah, join me next week. I've got you covered. It's easier than you might think. For now though, thanks for watching.